Brown L. My husband, Blaine, the president of Ball State University, is attending a meeting of the Board of Trustees elsewhere on campus and should be here very shortly. In addition to his obvious and well-known accomplishments, Blaine and I regard Professor Cornell West as a friend of our family because he has been such a good friend to our son-in-law and our daughter. In fact, our son-in-law will introduce our speaker and my pleasant task is to introduce our son-in-law. Before I get to that, I simply want to add a personal welcome to our speaker and publicly express our appreciation for his work in the area of social justice and for his support for younger scholars. And we want him to know that we have tried our best to give him a good forum here for his message. Brother West, we got you the biggest tent to preach in that we could find, but the weather has driven us inside. Now to the first introduction. Christopher Terez was born in El Paso, Texas, and is a graduate of Cathedral School in that city. He graduated from Princeton University in 1994, and Cornell West directed his senior thesis. Subsequently, Chris earned a master's degree in divinity and a master's degree in religion from Harvard University and spent a year studying as a Rotary Foundation Fellow at UNAM in Mexico City. He is now in the dissertation phase of his PhD program at Harvard, and his thesis will focus on the relationships between liberation theology and American pragmatism. Professor West is a member of his doctoral committee. Along the way, Chris met our daughter Allison at Princeton, and they were married in 1996. Blaine and I thought this was an especially intelligent thing for him to do. It is an understatement to say that Cornell West is, for Chris, and even to some extent for our daughter, an intellectual mentor and moral guide. Now to introduce our speaker, Mr. Chris Tires. Before I start, I have been instructed to let you know that after Dr. West speaks, you are invited to a question and answer period by coming up to the microphones in the front. So please line up and ask Professor West some good questions. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my deep and great privilege to honor and introduce to you a man that has been near and dear to my heart for close to 10 years now, Professor Cornell West. By way of introducing him, I would not only like to highlight some of his notable accomplishments as a scholar, but also I would like to give you a sense of what Cornell West is like as a person and how his own example as a human being has everything to do with his larger calling as an organic intellectual and as a cultural critic. As a scholar, Professor West's academic pedigree is impressive, to say the least. He graduated from Harvard College with honors in three years. As a graduate student, he received his PhD in philosophy from Princeton University, and he has taught courses in religion, philosophy, literature, and African American studies at Union Theological Seminary, Yale University, Princeton University, and Harvard University, where he was given the distinguished and rare title of university professor. He is now the class of 1943 University Professor of Religion at Princeton University. To add to this impressive resume, Professor West is the fourth most often cited scholar within the humanities and the social sciences. He has written or co-written over 16 books, and he is often referred to as the preeminent African-American scholar of our time. Such accomplishments speak for themselves. Briefly, 
I would also like to give you a more personal view of Cornell West. First, I would like to say a word or two about Cornell's love for ideas, which is equally broad as it is intense. When Cornell was an undergraduate, he was once so distraught about the differences between Kant and Hegel's conceptions of God that he spontaneously wrote a 50-page 50 50 paper to reconcile the differences between the two. His college roommates similarly recall that he even dreamed about ideas. He used to describe to them violent dreams in which philosophical concepts would take form and battle each other. But not only is his thinking deep as it is intense, it is also remarkably synthetic. Dr. West is able to weave together disciplines as diverse as political theory, analytic and continental philosophy, art criticism, religious studies, literary theory, pop and hip hop culture, sociology, theology, world history, and music theory. In this day and age of increasing academic specialization, I think it is fair to say that we simply have few two thinkers like him. For all of Cornell's raw intellectual talent, perhaps even more impressive to me, having known Cornell for 10 years, is the way in which he uses his intellectual gifts to speak to, to unwarranted forms of suffering in this world, from poverty and racism to homophobia and nihilism. In his role as a public intellectual, he travels all over the country on a nearly weekly basis to churches, prisons, talk shows, and schools and universities to engage theory with practice, ideas with problems. At the same time, he is also a committed teacher and mentor, sharing his time and talent in the most selfless of ways. If I had to choose one sentence that best characterizes what Cornell West is all about, it is this one, found in the Cornell West Reader, in which he writes, I have tried to be a man of letters, in love with ideas, in order to be a wiser and more loving person hoping to leave the world just a little better than I found it. I would like to end by saying that today, perhaps more so than ever, do we need a loving and wise voice to help us speak honestly about ourselves, our country, and our world, especially in light of a growing jingoism and xenophobia in this country. Cornell West is one prophetic soul among us who has the intellect, the integrity, and the courage to help us in this collective effort. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming distinguished professor, dear friend, and brother, Cornell West. God, what an introduction. But you can tell he is a friend of mine. I'd like to thank my dear friend and brother Chris Terrace for those very kind and generous words about me. I've known him for 10 years now, and I, as a teacher, of course, one often learns so much more from students than students learn from teachers. And Chris certainly is one from whom I've learned so very very much similarly so for his dear wife, my dear sister Allison, uh, who is a scholar in her own right, getting a PhD in American history as well as a JD at Harvard Law, and in the process of bringing to the world another gift from heaven, a beautiful little one. Uh, to my new friend and brother and the visionary captain of this ship, President Blaine, 
Brownell. Let us give him a hand, though. He's doing a wonderful job there. A wonderful job. Very much so. How rare it is to have a scholar of the urban context take over the helm of a university, and Ball State University is blessed as is he to be as is he blessed to be head of Ball State University. I should, I should say I'd like to also thank his dear wife, Marty Brown, now. I just was blessed to have a, uh, a lunch with, with Marty and her good friend, Judy Purse, and we did have a good time, I must say, a wonderful time. And I should say, I think we're going to have dinner tonight with a number of persons, so I look forward to breaking bread with you as well. Last but not least, uh, crucial public face of this grand institution is Terry Whit Bailey. And let's give her a hand. I would, I'd like to thank her for being so very kind. I'd like to thank her for being so very kind, not simply picking me up at the, at the airport, but engaging in such high-level conversation with such grace and elegance and civility. It's not always the case when one's picked up from airports. Uh, <laughs> She's intelligent, sharp, and kind and compassionate. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for coming out this afternoon. I am honored to be part of the university, bringing together so-called town and gown, larger community and university. This is a very rare occurrence in higher education these days. Very rare, and I'm told you've had giants like Danny Glover and others. I'm just sorry I was not here. Uh, he's a favorite of mine, and there's so many others as well who you have heard and will hear. I just hope that I say something this afternoon that thoroughly unsettles you. I know in part we're here to celebrate, but this is a university. We also want to unnerve, we want to unhouse each other. And by unhouse, what I mean is to be so challenged, even if for an instance we recognize that our worldview rests on pudding. And of course, the undergrads here at Ball State University understand that experience, don't you? You know what it's like to leave class and acknowledge, my God, those assumptions and presuppositions that I have need to be so thoroughly interrogated that I need to change undergo a metamorphosis by means of the exercise of my critical intelligence. I'm saying in part that any serious talk about democracy ought to begin with a Socratic moment. Socrates, 38A of Plato's Apology, the unexamined life is not worth living. Malcolm X adds, the examined life is painful. The unexamined life is not the life for a human. That's actually what Plato wrote. And we're here in part to talk about a democracy predicated on certain conceptions of what it means to be human. Understanding that our English word human derives from the Latin humando, which means burying. I'd like to remind our professors of humanities what they're about. They're about those who try to relate us to the beloved who are now the culinary delight of terrestrial worms. The dead. That we are those featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creatures born between urine and feces. Us. Cuts a little deeper than race and gender and class, doesn't it? Human, who often bury our dead to do what? To connect the three dimensions of time, past, present, and future. To connect us to those who are gone. Impose some structure of meaning and some structure of feeling so that we can connect, 
collaborate, cooperate, even coagulate with others. You see, discourses about community are not these kind of panegyric celebrations about how wonderful it is to all come together and eat the same kind of food and feel good. No, not at all. You're talking about a democracy. And if you're beginning with Socrates, we're talking about trying to muster the courage to think for oneself. Socrates says, based on Plato's text, 24a of that same dialogue apology, it was plain speaking, frank speaking, what the Greeks call parhesia. Plain speaking, frank speaking is the cause of my unpopularity, he says, as he's on the way for being put to death for his courage to exercise his critical intelligence. He says, philosophy itself is a meditation on and a preparation for death. Philosophy is a learning how to die. And by death here, I don't mean simply physical event of the body and the earth. I'm talking about what the Greeks call paideia, the cultivation of a self that requires the attempt to ensure that certain narrow assumptions die. Certain forms of parochialism, certain forms of provincialism, certain forms of fundamentalism, certain forms of immature thinking of Manichaean views about the world where well, all is good on one side and all is good on the other, that needs to die if you're serious about the Socratic challenge being not just educated, not just being mature, but being fundamentally human, which is to say the highest level of what the human spirit can aspire to without aid from the outside, be it divine, supernatural, whatever your particular theology or non-theology is. And how difficult it is, not simply in these times, in any time, but one could add, as Brother Chris did, especially now, to be honest about the various forms of jingoism and nativism. The fundamentalism may take the form of Judaic fundamentalism, Christian fundamentalism, Muslim fund fundamentalism, maybe even market fundamentalism, socialist fundamentalism too narrow, too truncated. Where is the need? Where are those who are willing to meet the challenge and acknowledge the need to care for their own souls in the form of self-questioning, self-interrogation, self-scrutiny, self-exploration? When I think of the Socratic challenge, I think, of the various forms of fundamental, fundamentalism and parochialism in myself before I proceed to a critique of society and the world. What kind of patriotism do I have lurking deep down in the precincts of my own soul? Is it a patriotism that acknowledges that the value of an American baby is the same as that of a baby born in El Salvador? in Tibet, in Iraq, in Ethiopia. When I look deep in my own soul and give my own critiques of vicious legacies of white supremacy and male supremacy, I say, what are the forms that white supremacy still takes in my own soul? And male supremacy takes in my own soul, or losing sight of the humanity of gay brothers and lesbian sisters in my own soul. Socratic. That's why William Butler Yeats said it takes more courage to dig deep into the dark corners of your own soul than it does for a soldier to fight on the battlefield. And education at its best, paideia at its best, has to do with constituting one's own self as 
an object of critical scrutiny first. Wrestling with the narcissism and the egoism and the egotism. Now, of course, I'm not talking about any of you all. You be honest. What a challenge. It's fundamental for democracy. Why? Because democracy is not simply a mode of governance. It's not simply a set of institutional arrangements. It's also a mode of being in the world. It's a way of life and it's a way of struggle. There's such a thing as a democratic personality. There's such a thing as an existential democrat. And we're certainly not talking about Democratic Party, Republican Party, Green Party, Libertarian Party. We'll get to that later. We're talking about something much deeper. What are the human modes of being in the space, in time, especially for those who are conscious of the fact that they cannot get out of space and time without going through the burying process, the cremation process. The great Seneca used to say that he or she who learns how to die unlearns slavery. You can write a dissertation on that. He or she who learns how to die unlearns slavery. If you can master self-scrutiny and self-questioning, then you are most free. You are no longer held captive, psychic captivity, intellectual captivity. You are never fully free. Why? Because we are never fully possessors of wisdom. We're perennially seekers for wisdom, but we can be wiser than we once were. There's such a thing as progress without perfection. And that's a certain kind of calling. And I would hope each and every one of us in our own ways if we're serious about celebrating community, serious about affirming the possibilities of democracy, serious about collaboration and cooperation and connection, to begin in the Socratic mode. Now granted, Socrates was such a fascinating man. He had a flat nose and thick lips and big belly. Never wore shoes, no matter what the season. He wore the same cloak. And sometimes he would just stand in an immobile position for 24 hours. Now, I don't recommend that to students. At Ball State University, you've got things to do. We also know that Socrates, like Jesus, never wrote one word. I don't recommend that <laughs> to either Ball State University students or our dear friends and comrades and fellow citizens from the community. What's fascinating about Socrates is, is that based on the stories told about him by Plato and Xenophon, and that satirical depiction of Socrates and Aristophanes as the clouds, what a critique, a distorted critique. What's fascinating about Socrates is he's never depicted as crying. Questions all the time. He revels in what Josiah Royce called the spirituality of genuine questioning. But he never sheds a tear. People may ask, well, was he married? <laughs> yes, he was. He married to Xanthepi. He had three sons. I've only got one son. I love him dearly, but I've shed many tears. I didn't need Tupac to tell me about what it means to shed tears. But it raises questions about Socrates, and this has crucial implications for what it means to talk about community and democracy. That the courageous exercise of critical intelligence is necessary, but it may not be a sufficient condition for what it fundamentally means to be human, let alone to, to, to promote the flourishing and flourishing of democracy. The intellect must never be the refuge of those who are unwilling to be fully themselves, mind, body, and soul. We know Socrates had an underdeveloped appreciation for art. He heard a voice all of his life saying, practice music, practice music. In the last hours of his life, he finally begins to diversify 
the various stories of Aesop and writes a hymn to the gods, but it's too late. He wishes he had a deeper appreciation of the arts, but he was too busy questioning, scrutinizing, interrogating. And that's why for, many, for me, any serious talk about community and democracy has to accent not solely the Socratic moment associated with Athens, but the prophetic moment associated with Jerusalem. What do I mean? Well, you can literally see the tears of Amos of the Hebrew Bible when he says, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Of course, for Christians, one of the high moments in the biblical text are two simple words, Jesus wept. Why? Because he loved so, he felt so deeply. Socrates, why did you ever not weep? Did you really live if you made it from womb to tomb without shedding a tear, no matter how many questions you ask? And if we're honest with ourselves, building community, and let alone sustaining, expanding, refining democracy, we have to talk as much about questioning as we do about compassion. When Mohammed walks into Mecca and sees the factions, sees the clashes, the ugly divisions, and articulates his own forms of tolerance that would mediate these ugly clashes. You can imagine tears in his eyes. Why? Because the best of Jerusalem Judaism, Christianity, Islam, the best, I'm not talking about the worst. It's predicated on the notion that the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak. And when you identify with suffering, when you're in solidarity with those who suffer, there will be tears, not sentimental tears. Not crocodile tears, but your heart is wrenched. Part of the challenge for us is somehow to bring together the best of Athens and the best of Jerusalem. How do we bring together the spirituality of genuine questioning with the spirituality of genuine compassion? If I only had three minutes left, I would just turn on John Coltrane's Love Supreme and walk off the stage. I remember you actually heard John Coltrane's Love Supreme. You know what I'm talking about. Genuine questioning of himself, the society, the various ugly ideologies that have shaped him and made him into something he doesn't want to be, yet he's struggling against it, trying to transform himself by means of his mind as well as his soul. But it's all about a love supreme. Tony Morrison's Be Love It. Wrestling with questioning, but always trying to connect. Tennessee Williams with the American Hamlet herself, Blanche Dubois, the streetcar named Desire. Intense interrogation, not just of the American South, which is so easy for Northerners to do without looking at themselves. As if the American South are not Americans, they're some other country. Each and every one of us, across class, race, gender, region, Wrestling with what? The great Tennessee Williams, that blues man, white brother, was all about. It's no accident his first collection of plays was called American Blues. Because he understood his connection to Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf and Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington 
And what is that connection? A willingness to engage in Socratic self-interrogation and attempt to connect by means of compassion and maybe inspire others to do the same thing. Best of the blues and jazz. Truth telling. And of course, as we know, up until about 35 years ago, it was so hard to find the truth about American history in textbooks, it was probably best to listen to the blues. <laughs> if you really want to know what was going on, especially given the legacy of white supremacy in the country. And in some ways, I'm sure some young people would say that today. If Mary J. Blige tells more truths about my life than I've been able to encounter in the classroom. I won't ask anybody to testify today, but it may very well be the truth. Thomas Pynchon certainly tells more of the truth about America in a blues form as novelists. Another white brother, blues a man. But the best of Athens and the best of Jerusalem, the Socratic and the prophetic, are indispensable for any serious talk about the democratic. But it requires so much. And this is what is troubling. This is what is frightening, especially in our day. Who has the courage to maybe make a fool out of herself and himself by speaking one's fallible truths and bearing one's imperfect witness at a moment in which increasing paranoia, escalating hysteria, polarization, balkanization, hard to engage in high quality conversation especially about pressing issues, not just the possible war in Iraq, not just about the controversy in the Middle East, not just about what's going on in Pakistan and India, not just about what the impact of Enron and Global Crossing and World.com is all about, but even our own social and personal lives, it's hard to be honest about. And that's why democracies are so rare in human history. Most of human history is the history of kings and queens, and some kind of elite, suzerains, potentates, monarchs, subjugating persons coercing persons, exploiting their labor, creating scapegoats, blaming the most vulnerable rather than confronting the most powerful. Democracies are so rare. The first democracy in human history that we know of with a recording, a set of recording evidence. 508 BC, Cleisthenes in exile comes back and joins the demos, which is precisely the etymology of democracy. Demos. Sly Stone called them everyday people. James Cleveland called them ordinary people. The demos. Raising their voices in institutions that guide and regulate their lives. And in 508, what happened? Fundamental shift from kinship to citizenship. The conscious moralizing of energy that was once targeted fundamentally and solely on family and tribe and clan now is shifted to something different. A demi. In the modern world, a nation. Who knows, 200 years from now, maybe international institutions and structures and influence. That's a fundamental shift, and it's a frightening shift. So I'm no certain freshman undergoing that right now. The move from mom and dad, and closely knit neighborhood, this cosmopolitan Muncie, Indiana, <laughs> Ball State University, 
only gain access to mom by phone, dad by phone, having to form new relationships, new identities is frightening. I'm not making a joke, I underwent the same thing from Sacramento, California to Cambridge. But the leap that Cleisthenes made to define identity no longer based on kinship, but now on demons, or residential, on something grander, is a qualitative leap. And it's very difficult for individuals and peoples to make that leap. And one of the reasons it's so difficult to do it because it takes courage for each and every one of the citizens to think for themselves and connect with other citizens, accenting not so much their secondary features and qualities, but rather their humanity. Now granted, that democracy in Athens was predicated on imperialism abroad. Think of Pericles' funeral or oration and Thucydides' Peloponnesian War. Freedom at home, domination abroad to constitute what? Unity at home, to constitute citizenship at home, subjugation abroad. External enemy generating unity. Is that the best that democracies can do? Patriarchal households, no woman was a citizen in Athenian democracy. Only caring and nurturing. Maleness as benchmark of citizenship. 2,500 years ago. And of course, echoes of the history of women in modern democracies. Women can vote in America when? 1920. England, 1928. France, 1945. It's not too old, is it? That's how deep the vicious legacy of male supremacy cuts then and now. Resident aliens who are not citizens but can participate in various activities in Greek democracy, like Aristotle himself, who's not a citizen, the one of the grand figures of Athenian democracy. You see. What am I saying? Why is this important? It's important because for democracies to survive, let alone thrive, there must be increasing numbers of democratic personalities who are willing to step forward to dissent whatever the orthodoxy, left, center, or right, and then have the courage to love. By courage to love, what I mean is to have a universal scope that brings critique to bear on every form of groupism and tribalism. When we look at the history of modern democracies, it's here that we come to the United States. It's here that we come to the New World, latter part of the 18th century. Let us create an experiment in which the consent of the governed is the criteria for legitimate government. Radical idea. Subversive notion. But the context is what? First you own somebody else's land. You gonna include the indigenous peoples in on this? Or will they become the precondition for the flowering and flourishing of your democracy. 22% of your 13 colonies are enslaved Africans. Are they included? Or are they part of the prerequisite for the flourishing and flowering of your grand democratic experiment? 
51% of those are women. Will they play a role? The vast majority of men are non-property holding. Will they play a role? Already constraints on a very precious yet precarious experiment in democracy. So much better than being occupied or colonized or subjugated or just an appendage to the British Empire. Yes. That's why George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison and others exercise the courage to think for themselves and the courage to connect with persons who unfortunately were for the most part like themselves but were still anti-imperialist. We don't like to think of George Washington as an urban gorilla with guns. People think, oh, you talking about the Black Panther Party? No, we're talking about George Washington. <clears throat> Won three out of nine battles, but the right ones. Courageous. But predicated on precisely indigenous people's land, his own slaves, women in the household, working people steal in some significant way middle of the hierarchy. But what a grand project. Every democracy, imperfect, unfinished. Every democracy, parentally involved in trying to create more Socratic sensibilities, more prophetic sentiments. And when we look back now in the year 2002, what do we see? We see a very, very rich, history of trying to sustain a democracy that in some sense flawed, in another sense still going in the longest continuous democratic experiment in the history of the modern world. Internally, of course, the one fundamental issue that that democracy must wrestle with, even though there's a host of other issues, has to do with race. We know that. Race has always been the rawest nerve of the country. It's always been the most difficult dilemma. We look for the reference to institution of slavery and white supremacy in the US Constitution, you can't find it. It's called denial. Joseph Ellis has just written a wonderful book on the founding brothers. He calls it a silence. Don't want to deal with it. It's too overwhelming end up with a civil war, fighting over something that's not even invoked in your constitution, amending an institution that's not even acknowledged in your constitution. That's not just a uh, marginal affair. It has something to do with the fundamental self-understanding of the country. The refusal to want to be Socratic and acknowledge one of its fundamental dogmas. If we're going to examine any kind of dogma, then one particular dogma is going to be one that resulted in the country in civil war. 620,000 dead, more dead just on the Union side than all of the precious American lives lost in World War II. We forget about that. 340,000 lives lost in World War II, 345,000 just on one side in the Civil War. That's how deep it was. And we're only talking at this point internally. We haven't yet to talk about externally what's going on. We haven't yet to make the connection between the issues of gender and class internally or the issues of empire externally. When we come to the year 2002, in which we now live in the hyperpower of our present epoch, the grandest empire since the British Empire, even possibly the Roman Empire, military might, 
political might, cultural influence, witnessing the Americanization of the world, maybe even of certain planets, since we got there first. How do you engage in Socratic reflection about this? Prophetic reflection about this, not in the spirit of self-righteousness, but self-criticism, why? For the sacred honor of the children, here and abroad. Where are the courageous voices? Where are the courageous critiques? Where are the courageous efforts to ensure that our conversation is one that does honor to the Socratic and prophetic legacies? That's a question, of course, I throw out to you. How do we celebrate community and affirm democracy at this particular moment? Now, granted, the impact of September 11, 2001 is real. 3,000 precious lives lost. Vicious attack. Not just by terrorists, but by thugs. Kill innocent people, no matter what color. For the first time in the history of the country, every American to some degree feels unsafe, unprotected, subject to unjustified violence, and hated. Now, that's a new experience for most Americans. I just never felt hate it just because I simply tried to be. I never felt unsafe. I never felt unprotected. I never felt subject to random and unjustified violence. And that is a frightening and terrifying human predicament. But you see, the history of people of African descent inside of America is one of feeling unsafe, unprotected, subject to unjustified violence, and hated by many of their fellow citizens up until recently. That's what a so-called nigger was. And so since 9-11, we've witnessed the niggerization of the whole country. The niggerization of the whole country. Everybody feeling the same thing. What kind of response to it? We've got military might still unsafe. Economic power still unprotected. Disneyland still hated. I mean, Disneyland is all about fun. You know, Americans coined that term fun, we should say. It's quite fascinating. The sad thing is, is that in so many ways that Disneyland reflects a certain corner of the American mind because Disneyland brags that no one has ever died on their premises. And where there's no death, there's no life, there's no rebirth. If you go somewhere just to have fun, you're escaping, you're denying. Nothing wrong with doing it for a moment, but don't remain in that state of mind. Don't remain in that state of mind. But what is distinctive about people of African descent is that black people have had to be on intimate terms with death. Slavery was a form of social death. No legal status or social standing or public worth. Jim Crow and Jane Crow is a form of civic death. You have no rights that fellow citizens need respect. That white supremacy that teaches people of color to hate themselves is a form of spiritual death and psychic death. And here you have a people who are on intimate terms with death in a civilization that denies death. Hence, you get very conflicting and alternative views and perspectives about the world. Part of what it is to live behind the veil, to use W.B. Du Bois's great metaphor, the veil that divides a 
America, psychically, not just racially. Because it's not just a matter, as I said before, it's Tennessee Williams is on the blue side. See, Britney Spears, we have to debate about her. <laughs> God bless and be with her. Clarence Thomas, we got to debate about that, brother. So it's not a racial divide. It has to do with what kind of vision you have, what commitment you have, what orientation you have. Never allow anybody to pigeonhole you based on your race, gender, or class. You're a human being who has choices that you can make if you have enough courage to think for yourself and love deep enough. You see. But at this particular moment, who has the courage to say that Sodom Hussein is a gangster now and when the United States was in alliance with him he was a gangster then who has the courage to say that bin Laden is a gangster now and when he was in alliance with the United States he was a gangster then who has the courage to say both in part created by the CIA and now wanted by the FBI Meaning what? If you're going to talk about terrorists and gangsters and thugs, begin first with oneself, one's own thuggish dispositions. <laughs> then look around in one's own context and neighborhood, because I grew up with some thugs. I love them to death, they're just thugs. I knew that, everybody knew that. And we brought some serious critique to bear on them because they did not contribute to the health of the community, to put it euphemistically. Sometimes we're around telling folk, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> then I look at our elites. What are their thuggish dispositions? What does it mean to have access to a millions and millions of dollars when your workers' pensions are being sucked up and devoured. That's thuggish behavior. You see? That's thuggish behavior. When I look at certain churches and mosques and synagogues and see these leaders in for the money rather than the rich, deep, religious content of the way of life, that's thuggish behavior. Thuggish behavior. When I look at certain portions of U.S. foreign policy, what went on in Guatemala in 1954 and Brazil in 1965, what went on in Iran in 1954, overthrowing democracies in the name of American foreign policy, which claims to be concerned about democracies, that's thuggish behavior. No thuggish act justifies another thuggish act. Not at all. Not at all. A lot of people say, oh, Brother West, you know, when you begin to talk this way, you sound anti-American. I say, I'm just trying to be Socratic and prophetic. And I happen to be a Christian, too, but we won't get into that today. But I always put the cross over the flag now. No doubt about that. And not only that, but you try to be consistent, you see, thoroughly consistent. You see. Same is true in the Middle East. You see. No to thuggish behavior on behalf of Palestinians. No to thuggish behavior on the, past of the, on the on part of the Israelis. Killing of innocent people, suicide bombers, thuggish activity. Subjugation, occupation of a people, thuggish behavior. Why not just tell the truth across the board? To do what? To try to free people up so that a conversation can become more robust and uninhibited. And most importantly, so that that plain speaking that made Socrates so unpopular can become contagious so that his spirit can still live, even given the death that occurred in 399 BC when the Athenian democracy put Socrates 
to death. What is our challenge today? It's multifold. First and foremost, we have to enter in the spirit of intellectual humility. That no one of us, no one people, no one political party, no one political organization has the solution or the panacea for the variety of problems that we have. It cannot be done by one slice of the population. That's why dialogue is so crucial. Not chit chat. Chit chat is just exchanging views and no one pushing and challenging one another and therefore no change and transformation taking place. The great Martin Buber, the, the philosopher of dialogue, one of the many philosophers of dialogue like Gadamer and Collingwood and Levinas says you ought to be a little different when you leave dialogue than when you entered. If you feel exactly the same, it was just nice little chit chat and gossip. I have nothing against it, I just don't think it ought to become pervasive. Dialogue. The centrality of dialogue. And unfortunately, in moments of time or increasing possibility, possibility for war, dialogue is the first casualty. Dissent is the second casualty. And with no dialogue, there's no substantive truths coming forth. Just everybody's pumping their propaganda machine. Rationalization after rationalizations. No democracy can survive without substantive dialogue. That's John Dewey in his text of 1927, The Public and His Problems, one of the great democratic theorists. That's the first thing, community, democracy, dialogue. The second thing, trying to cultivate deeper forms of compassion, to get beyond our own tribal forms of compassion, concerned solely about our own particular group. Nothing wrong with self-interest, it ought to be broadened, enlightened, deepened, so that there's a compassionate dimension to it. And last, and I say this especially to young people, there is a crucial need for new kinds of leaders and leadership. And historically, in democracies, that energy has come from younger generations who have not already become so jaded and incorporated and absorbed into thinking within a narrow box, but rather having the courage to traverse those boundaries. Martin King was 26 years old when he began his movement. Dorothy Day was 22. You all know Dorothy Day, the great Catholic sister involved in the struggle for social justice. Miles Horton, the white brother in Tennessee that founded Highlander Center where Rosa Parks and a Stokely Carmichael and a Robert Moses and a Tom Hayden and Andrew Goodman, white, black, Jewish, Cesar Chavez, brown, could all come together. Miles Horton, if you get a chance to look at his autobiography, I'm sure it's here in the library, it's called The Long Haul. Ku Klux Klan burned it down every seven years, had to build it up again. Young brother, new leadership, wrestling with Socratic legacy, wrestling with prophetic legacy, and most importantly, trying to be honest about himself, ourself, yourself. Thank you also very much for being patient. I look forward to our questions and queries. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. No, thank you for being, for being patient, Mr. Rock. We'll have a good time for questions and queries and so on. Cornell? Yes, here we go. We, let, let's wait maybe just 15 seconds so we'll let people kind of clear out. Is that all right? I want everybody to hear your question and not be distracted.
things that impress me. Most many people say slavery was a long time ago, but one of the ladies that was interviewed here in Muncie was my Sunday school teacher when I was a small boy. Hmm. So it's not that long ago. Absolutely. The thing that has bothered me and worried me and seemed to be the cruelest parts of slavery was the breaking up of families. The father was sold away, the mother was sold away, the brothers and sisters were sold away. Have any social studies been done to understand what impact that has had on the African American community in the United States? Do you know of any of those? I mm, appreciate that question though, brother. It's a very important question. There's two studies. The first is by Andrew Billingsley, who is a distinguished scholar uh, at University of Maryland, College Park. It's, it's dealing with the history of the black family. And there was another book by Herbert Gutman, who was written, oh, maybe 20 years ago, which is also an alternative history of the black family. But those are the two major works that look at both the history of the black family and the impact of, of the shattering of black familiar relations with babies sold in one part of the country, mothers in another, fathers in another. And of course, it's no accident that after the, uh, uh, the end of slavery, the first thing that black folk did was search for their family members, sometimes on their bare feet, on their bare feet. But there's something else I want to add to this when you talk about American slavery. And that is this, that beginning with Gabriel Broser's rebellion, which began at the funeral of a slave child five years old. Oftentimes, slave insurrections would be associated with that burying, that burial rite. And in some ways, as I said before, we define human, humando, as burying, the most fundamental form of dehumanization is not to allow people to treat their dead in the way that they want, often by burial. That's what got Antigone upset, right? That's why she could present herself with her courage, the Creon, because she couldn't bury her beloved brother. Clash. Well, in American slavery, after the Gabriel Broser Rebellion, there were a number of laws that did not allow black people to bury their dead. So at that point, the family being shattered, the psychic being attacked, and then not even having the right to say goodbye to mama in the way you want to. None of us can't even conceive of that. Now, some folk these days, too lazy or disoriented to show up at the funeral, but they have a right to go. <laughs> you see, that's also the fundamental form of dehumanization that occurred to Jewish brothers and sisters during the European Holocaust, the Shoah. You can't even find the body parts. It's in the cremation. You can't even connect. And we've seen it with our dear fellow citizens with uh, 9-11, right? You just go to the place just to see one small bone. That was Aaron. That's the brother I love. He was my Let me grab that bone. Put it in a special place. See, black folk had over 70 years where significant numbers could not bury their dead. That could drive up people crazy. That's why one of the spirituals says, Lord, how come me born here? What kind of God are you? I still love you so. A simple faith, a demon of doubt in the faith that makes the faith richer because they're in tune with reality. See what I mean? Now see, that for me is, 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 is some of the best of what it means to wrestle with being human and America. Because in the end, all human beings have to acknowledge that there may be moments in their own lives where there are certain forms of that kind of dehumanization coming at them, even well-to-do. Misunderstood, distorted, demeaned, degraded. And they can identify with their blues, like spiritual 
Or maybe it might just be Bessie Smith. I'm not talking about God. She just got the blues. And she's singing the blues. She's not worried about her theology. There's a secular tradition in the black community too. The black church is rich, but it has no monopoly on all the quality voices. You, see? you know what I mean? I don't, let me stop here and go on to question. Yeah. Brother Cornell, you yes, gave us a brilliant uh, critique of American foreign policy. Could you tell us what the alternatives are? Yeah, that's a good question. It's a good question. Yeah, we're wrestling right now. How do you how do you reshape American government and economy, and how do you influence U.S. foreign policy? I think one of the ways of doing it is you've got to fight the prevailing climate of opinion. You've got to try to expose more fellow citizens to alternative visions, alternative analysis, and alternative ways of looking at the world. It's one of the crucial roles of a university in which you have discourses involved in reflections on these realities from a variety of different political, ideological, philosophic points of view. And then you have to have political leaders who are willing to speak, to broaden the discussion, to shatter some of the stereotypes and so on. Uh, sometimes that means mass demonstration and going to jail, as Michael Lerner and I did just back in, uh, in April over, the, over our opposition to Sharon's policies and our opposition to the suicide bombers uh, coming, from Pal coming from the Palestinian side. Uh, uh, sometimes it takes the form of trying to elect certain officials who are courageous enough. Sometimes it takes the form of divestment. There's a lot of different debates about tactics as to how you influence U.S. foreign policy. At the moment, it's very difficult. We don't have the most visionary elites in the White House. <laughs> but, you, but you can't stop trying. Just go right ahead. In an environment that doesn't welcome change and sometimes can be from hostile to not cooperative, what is the best way to make that change? Uh, you, you're in an environment now that's challenging at best. What's mm. the best way to approach that hostility to change? Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate that. One I think is, uh, I mean, I, I'd like to try to uh, empathize with the person that does not want to change by trying to enter their skin and their world and find out what it is that resists, that leads them to resist change. Are they misunderstanding what I'm saying? Are they casting it solely in terms of their own self-interest and therefore they're holding on for dear life? Uh, uh, do they have some reasons that are good reasons that I have not yet considered so that I can come up with other strategies and tactics to convince them to change? And of course it relates different from issue to issue, context to context. But there has to be, here Socrates is very important again, there has to be something you think inside of that person, in their family, their culture, their community, that will connect them to what you're talking about. You see, so if they hate you so, they must love somebody. Now, who do they love? And how do you convince them that the way in which they love, you also would like to be, if not loved in the same way that you have a love that ought not to be violated, you see? It's the beginnings of some kind of empathy and compassion. Now, other times, it's just entrenched power, you know, and Hobbes and Machiavelli and others remind us, and we need the Hobbeses and Machiavellis around so that we don't become naive in talking about empathy and morality and so forth. But if the world is solely the world of Hobbes and Machiavelli and, 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 and Thrasymachus, then uh, it might make right. Then it's a very, then we're all gangsters. So we're just all playing gangster games. You see, now if that's the case, we're all in a world of trouble. It's hopeless, especially for the poor, especially for the poor. And I do believe at times it's nearly hopeless, but never solely hopeless. And it's a moment when it looks as if it's thoroughly hopeless. You see. But that doesn't mean then that we don't take seriously the more Machiavellian strategies because that's a part of the world, it's part of reality. But even those who deploy such strategies are still human beings. That's why I never demonize anybody or any group and so forth. Even Nazis, I mean there's a tendency in the Western world to somehow think that Nazis come from Mars rather than 
a particular country, a particular civilization. You see. They were human beings too. They were just cowardly and hateful and bigoted and concerned about their own natural interests and willing to do anything to gays and gypsies and communists and socialists and especially Jews. You see. You see. And that's, it's an important message to remind our, ourselves in that regard because then we think that somehow we're not capable of that. Look at your own country, look at your own neighborhood, look at your own state, look what you're putting up with. You know what I mean? My God. Let me just give you one, one, one particular example of this. Uh, right now you got 46% of young black brothers between 18 and 26 in Baltimore and D.C. either on probation, on parole, or in prison. It's unprecedented. If that were the case for any other group of, black, uh, of, of young men, it would be a national emergency. National. You got 32% of young black children, 38% of brown children living in utter poverty in the richest nation in the history of the world. No discourse about it. And yet trillions of dollars stolen from the top. And it becomes an interesting debate bringing in the celebrity CEOs and so forth. If it had been a welfare mother, demeaning, degrading, demonizing, lack of responsibility, can't get her life together, and all she stole was a white Cadillac. Enough money for a white Cadillac. How does that compare to the third level of corporate elites who get away with it? The double standard is overwhelming. What will be said about us 50, 100 years from now in regard to this in the same way we look at Europe in the 1930s or America in the 1840s under slavery, you see? I think it's the same kind of indictment. Where were the voices, you see? Where was the organizing? What happened to these people? They were amusing themselves to death. They were too depressed to get moving. They couldn't de deal with the intimate relations and that preoccupied them 85% of the time. They were obsessed with their careers because they certainly weren't attending to the children given the drift of young folk. You see, you see what I mean? I mean, that's the kind of thing that concerns me. Yes, go right ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. West. Thank you for coming. I wish my lectures were half as good as yours. <laughs> well, I'd love to attend your lectures. <laughs> <laughs> my question is, uh, sometimes when I'm starting to feel apathetic, I'm tempted to believe that uh, politics is simply a process of collecting a group of people together to divide up the economic pie. And my question is, can uh, politics make any meaningful contribution to our public life beyond the collection and redistribution of economic resources? Yeah, it's a good question, too. It's a very important question. Everybody heard that question? I think that politics at its best, when you have statespersons, not just politicians, and it's so rare to have statespersons. I think Bill Bradley was probably one of the few candidates left in that regard. But when, you have, when you have the Lincolns, when you have the FDRs, uh, 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 statespersons contribute to the vision of a people. It gives them a deeper sense of themselves that transcends their own parochial interests. That's why when I talked about um, our dear president here, I called him a visionary leader. You see, I put a lot of weight on that. You see, because vision is not a vision thing, as a fellow citizen once said from Texas. That's the commodification of vision. Vision is a power. That's why the biblical text says what? Where there is no vision, the people perish. And they don't perish simply because of material things. They perish psychically, they perish spiritually, they can no longer relate to one another. They can't generate bonds of trust that are so precious for any kind of community. And no amount of material things can serve as a sole foundation for trust. Right? I mean, we've got marriages that can testify to that, right? You have all the money in the world. That's not going to generate trust. Something else, some non-market activity has to be in place love compassion and so forth and that's what i think a, a, a states person can do you see and that's what helps bring a community together but of course you hope that your vision is not one that's predicated on demonizing another 
because Pericles had a grand vision for Athens. And it was a grand vision, it just also happened to be one that included imperial domination for those outside, the barbarians. See, and the barbarians were those who were subject to tyranny, were not citizens in that sense. But I do think that, that politics can be more than that. And uh, in a democracy, I think we all have to simply go down trying with every fiber of our being to ensure that there's some visionary dimension, some ethical, uh, uh, strong ethical aspect to any of our politics, even given the Machiavellian machinations that are inevitable. Yeah, I'm wondering, you're talking about, I guess on the same theme, um, hum the need for reflection and humility. And I see our current administration as having the least reflectiveness, except in the manipulative sense, and the least humility of any of the, the 50 years that I've been alive. And I go out, I speak a lot, I'll speak tomorrow. Mm. And at certain points, it just stuns me how hard it is to talk directly about that. So, if you have some yeah, no, I appreciate that. Well, first, I think we have. And also, bur all the other issues get buried. You know, the election right. gets buried by the first policies. The first policies get buried by September 11th. September 11th gets buried by Iraq, and we never can really talk about what's going on. No, it's it's true. And, I mean, and, and, and events often do overrun any particular set of intentions. But first, I want to start off by saying something very positive about uh, President Bush. Uh, and I think it's very important, actually. You see, when 9-11 hit, if he had not publicly distinguished between Islam and particular gangsters who were using Islam to attack innocent persons, we could have seen what we saw with the Japanese brothers and sisters in World War II. That was an act of leadership. We were talking about what politicians can do. Now, granted, I was surprised, you know, but I mean, <laughs> I'm gonna be very honest about this. I was very surprised. I was glad, I, and I, each time I, I was on television, I would say that, and, and his people would make contact with him and say, you know, Professor West, we can't believe you're saying something positive about the president. That's what I'm just trying to speak the truth, and it happens to be positive about the president. That's very important because we could have had a moment in which we already have now had 1,200 Arab and Muslim Americans detained. We have 5,000 taken in. It could have been a massive, vicious, violent attack if you had wrong kind of leadership. Now, that was a moment. Then there's Ashcroft in the Justice Department. That's something else. <laughs> it didn't translate in the way that I would like. You see what I mean? And there I would agree with you, in fact, that uh, um, since then, there's been very little self-credit. I would give Colin Powell some credit in this regard. I think he's been holding out for a multilateralist vision. Yeah. And it's one that I think is very important in terms of the role, not just of Congress, but of the United Nations as well. Having some kind of civil respect for allies, even though we are the superpower at the moment. No superpower lasts forever. No empire lasts forever. There's mortality even among empires. Usually begins internally. And if you're concerned about keeping democracy alive, then you keep track of both. But if it reaches a point where it no longer even makes the pretense of being democratic, and there is a creeping authoritarianism at work, the U.S. Patriotic Act is a very low moment in the history of American legislation. There's no doubt about that. And we can debate about that. But we still have a possibility of curtailing the worst of it. But the creeping authoritarianism is taking place. There's new forms of McCarthyism running afoot that will trump conversation, that will foreclose dialogue, that will silence critics, that will demean anybody who expresses their opinion that doesn't fit with the mainstream. We have to be courageous about that. You see, and people like Paul Robeson, inspirations, whether you agree with them or not, they spoke their minds and he lived under house arrest for seven years in Philadelphia. That's, some, that's, that's, that's an inspiration. That's the kind of inspiration I think we need. So that's the beginning of an answer to, 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 to your question. Just, just, just one, one or two more? Well, you know what we should do is this. We, we have four, right? Let's ask the four in a row. I won't say a word until the end. Is that all right? Is that all right? Now write it down. Now. Okay. 
Uh, I have a collection of uh, non-fiction books signed by the author. I was wondering if you could sign this. I will definitely sign your book, though, brother. I'll, I'll wait until everyone else. I will definitely. But I want to tell you, though, there is a short story in there, in that book. Okay. Yeah, I got that single song, a short story. I'm very proud of that short story. So I just mentioned it when you say non-fiction. <laughs> yeah, okay, but no, I, I, I'll sign it, though. All right. I was, I was asking, wondering what um, your current field, there's a current trend in media right now towards agitation and people using the media to get vested interest across. And I was asking if there was any way that a power could, if, if a power, if there's any precedent of a power shutting that down, even though it might be in their best interest and in what people receiving the media can do. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that, though, brother. I, 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 I'm going to hold off now on, on all of these questions. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to ask how you feel that um, hip hop culture and music can be used for racial unification in the U.S. Yeah, that's a good question. Appreciate that. Uh. <laughs> Last one. I first have to thank you, um, Professor West, for your courage. Um, it's rare to find an intellectual who also speaks about compassion, and we need your voice. And thank you. Um, in education, one of the concerns um, that we have is to bring about dispositions. The critical disposition is one we're working on. We think we understand that. Um, it's not. It's not encouraged in all places, but right, right. theoretically we know about it. What about um, compassion? Can, you, can we educate for compassion? Mm -hmm. Well, we've got some good questions here. Let me begin with hip hop, I think. <laughs> well, we got some tough ones here. Uh, uh, no, I think that um, Anytime you talk about hip hop, you're talking about a particular kind of cultural communication. Uh, we can argue how much is music, how much is spoken, and so forth and so on. But the same issues that I talk about in terms of courage to speak one's mind, courage to love, you can find it among certain hip hop artists. You can find the same kind of hatred and bigotry among certain hip-hop artists, right? The misogyny, the homophobia, and so forth. It is not monolithic. It is in no way homogeneous. There is a multiplicity and plurality of hip-hop voices, just as there were a multiplicity and plurality of, of musical voices when I was coming along. You see, I'm the Curtis Mayfield Philly Sound generation, Motown generation, and, uh, you know, people knew the difference. Uh, between Dyke and the Blazers and M Marvin Gaye. All of them were talented, but Marvin's What's Going On had something a little bit more relevant to say than shaking the behind. You know, and booty calls nothing new in the history of young people in America. Just a little bit more raw in his language. I have nothing against, you know, dancing and different kind of dancing either. But it has that, in the end, what you hope be connected to something more than just pleasure for a moment. Uh, nothing wrong with pleasure either. I'm not a Puritan, but it has to be a pleasure linked to some kind of joy, which means sharing and communion rather than just manipulative and, and, and pornographic in the metaphoric sense of what I can get out of it. See what I mean? And the younger generation is being bombarded with a kind of manipulative, predatory, orientation, many of whom are hip-hop artists. There's no doubt about that. But there's not all hip-hop artists. You can actually go to a whole host of other music and see it. I mean, it's in country music. It's there. People just don't highlight it. You see. It's in mainstream music and so on. But I think it can be a crucial role. Now, I want to mention my dear brother, uh, Russell Simmons. As you know, we've We've been a part of the Hip Hop Summit now for three years. He's got to Hip Hop Get Out to Vote that's playing a very important role. We're doing the same thing this next year and this, this, this fall in elections. And, and that's just the beginning because Russell Simmons himself, I tell him all the time, he and I are old, outdated, antiquated, played out. We need a younger generation to come in and move us aside. You see. But we're going to hold on with the, uh, with, with the hip hop musicians as long as we can in, t in trying to elevate and connect it to a... Uh, a different level. I mean, one of the reasons why I made my own CD 
was precisely to intervene in this way. Now, certain presidents don't like that. But that's all right. It's not about them. It's, it's not about them. I taught in prison for 17 years. If I can inspire one young person, that's my benchmark. There's no college president who somehow dictates my calling and my vocation. I'm not here to serve any particular president. Uh, uh, I'll listen to the critique because I'm a Democrat, but I'm not going to serve him, you see. Uh, agitation. Yeah, where was that young brother asked that question? Yeah, yeah, I want to look at you. Uh, it, it, this idea of, of shutting anything down, we want to be very, very leery about. Now, I don't know what you meant by shutting down. You know what I mean? When Abe Lincoln suspended habeas corpus, I think he's in many ways a statesperson, but I think he was wrong to do that. You see? And by shutting down, do you mean in some way allowing new voices? Do you mean pushing them out? Do you mean democratizing it in such a way that we don't have to hear the same kind of voices that have oftentimes so little to say? I was just speaking about unethical sources and whether or not, even I guess it is a question whether or not they should be removed. I, I came in with the notion that they should, but I'm willing to listen that if somebody's using news media as an unethical means to reach people, then that mm. person should at least be reprimanded or there should be dialogue about it. Dialogue held accountable? scrutinize yes you see i'm a libertarian in terms of uh, allowing people uh, the right to make fools of themselves i mean we all have that right because you can imagine someone saying to me that brother doesn't need to be speaking at ball state university he's putting forward unethical things shut that negro down and of course i have much less power than some of the other folk now we could talk about fox news and see certain conservative voices there with bestsellers and so forth and so on. And they just need to be held accountable. Well, you said this. Here's the evidence. Your argument was this. Here, here are the holes. You made this inference. Here's the lack of validity. But the question then becomes, well, where are the voices that try to engage in that kind of critique? Now, that's what's dangerous. And then when you begin to look at the monopoly and the oligopoly in the means of communication with a small group of persons controlling all of the various channels. Then you got a power issue. That's when you got to go to Congress. You see, I mean, one of the reasons why I think we have such low quality music on radio for young people is because there's a monopoly on the radio stations that won't allow for the proliferation of the variety of voices of the younger generation. So you hear the same songs every five minutes. Why is that so? Payola. Why is that so? Various impersonal networks of what I call corrupt relationship. And I'm not saying it just because they won't play my album on, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, I was, just, I was with Prince just two, two months ago in Paisley Park. He has not had one song played in almost a decade. You had to go to the old good, the, the oldie station. They hear kiss, a sign of the times. And then he, now he's become Joe Witness, so he's cleaned up all of the erotic city and all of that, see. So you know he's not going to be playing another radio station, see. And you say, what's going on? Monopoly. Television the same way. Publishing houses of text. Increasing monopoly. We need to be debated about. We need to have a debate in terms of legislation. We need to debate in terms of the larger uh, forums and what have you, you see. But it's just, I'm just reacting to your metaphor. We say it's a metaphor of shutting down. You know, we don't want to shut down anything. You know what I mean? Not at all. If it causes injurious harm, yes. Then you've got to, then you have a case to make but we have to really allow persons to express their views across the board, whatever, whatever, whatever their views are. See, even, even when they're uh, racist and sexist, you see. I think the Ku Klux Klan have a right to be wrong as long as they don't touch anybody. See, as soon as they touch somebody, then people have to move on, the state and so forth and so on. You see. Now, it's very interesting that, that Bush has not put the Ku Klux Klan on the terrorism list. That's very interesting. 
he put the Nation of Islam on the list before he puts the Klan. The Nation of Islam was not responsible for one death of a white brother or sister. Isn't that something? You would think every time Farrakhan opens his mouth, white folks just start falling out there. <laughs> he's killing them, he's killing them, he's killing them. And the Klan has killed thousands of blacks and Catholics and Jews. You got evidence of it. Some of them proud of it. Nowhere near the list. Nation of Islam right there. Ready to go on the list. That's bias. That's double standard. You see what I mean? And that's the kind of thing I think that we have to make public. We have to speak openly about it, you see. And that's true for any kind of uh, group that engages in killing innocent folk. IRA, PLO, Jewish Defense League. Nobody wants to talk about Jewish terrorists. You would think that's an oxymoron in America. Never been a Jewish terrorist. They're human beings. If they're human beings, more than likely, some are going to have some terroristic proclivities. It's just, just highly likely, that's all. People say, well, there's no Quaker terrorists. <laughs> it's an interesting test case. <laughs> there's probably some, but I haven't hunted them down. But they're human beings, so I know this. Last but not least was this issue of education and how do we educate for compassion. See, I, I don't think there's any formula, there's no algorithm in this regard. Uh, there's a wonderful moment in Kant's Critique of Pure Reason where he says examples are the go-kart of judgment and that judgment is mediated by a certain kind of disposition and something like passion and empathy and what have you is really by means of a, an example of persons who see it in other persons. That's one of the things I love about Plato's relationship to Socrates. I might disagree with his politics. He loved that man. He was invested in that man. He was in he, he was mourning for him. He wanted to ensure that the relation that he had, the deep, deep connection that Socrates had with him and the impact that he had on Plato would be forever remembered. And it was not solely by means of some philosophic formula. It was by means of a certain way of being in the world, dialogical way of being in the world that he saw enacted in the life of Socrates. The same is true with Jesus. The same is true with Jesus. And it's probably appropriate to end with Jesus of Nazareth. I don't want to hear a sermon. I want to see one. You see, that's what Jesus was talking about. But what about the kingdom of God? If the kingdom of God is within you, then everywhere you go, you leave a little heaven behind. That's Jesus. Like the conclusion of an Aristotelian syllogism, practice, action, example, being in the world, not just talking about it. That's, in the end, I think, what it's about. And when you think of our own lives, right? think of our own lives. Think, think of yourself and myself. I saw it in my father. I didn't have to worry about propositions and texts. I saw it in my grandmother. I saw it in my brother. I see it in my mother. I see it in my deacon. Not all of them, but Deacon Hinton. I saw it in my teacher. In college, graduate school, I have seen it with some of the brothers and sisters here at Ball State University. And that's what keeps me going, is that education is deeper than that. You see, you know what I mean? But it has an educative dimension. Got to run. You all take good care. Thank you so very much.